June 5th, the sixth month already. Half the year is over. Can you believe it? June 5th, 2016. Today, next please. We want to welcome everyone who is attending here for the first time, or if you're watching for the first time, we want to welcome you. Let's give everybody for the first time a big round of applause. Welcome. Worship here with us. Next, please. Next, please. And today is the 54th day of tr uh, all true things. All things. True all things. The true all things. It used to be the day of all things. Remember that? And Father put the word true in there. So it's the day of true all things. And that is from, that, is, that picture is from 1963. Look at that, 1963. You can see it on the Chinese characters be, behind, Father. Okay, next please. It's also the fourth anniversary of the fourth dimension registration ceremony. This is the declaration of the unity of victorious Cain and Abel. Kuk, uh, Father called Kuk Jinim and myself up. And made that declaration on that day. So that's the fourth anniversary of that. Yes, next please. And we had a second year anniversary here at Sanctuary Church. Second year anniversary. Had a wonderful festivities. Great performances. How, how many enjoyed the performances? Yeah. Wasn't that amazing? The kids are amazing. All the different performances were wonderful. And uh, had a fantastic time in a glorious weather in the park. Uh, Promised Land Park, that was really wonderful. Had some wonderful taki, takoyaki and hamburger and hamburger takoyaki. <laughs> so it was absolutely wonderful time. Great to see everybody out there, blessed with weather and coolness, you know, in the Poconos. So what a what a blessed day. Okay, next please. We want to announce the winners of the second anniversary Praise Painting and Poetry Awards. And do that, I'm going to ask Greg to come up and announce who the winners were. Are they up there already? They're already up there. They're already up there. <laughs> no surprise. Go ahead. You can do it, though. Okay. Well, it was a glorious uh, day last Sunday. And we had some uh, competition of poetry and painting. And uh, Tammy O'Brien, is she here? Where is Tammy O'Brien this morning? Well, she is the winner among uh, other, uh, you know, many people had uh, poetry uh, sent in as well as uh, paintings, but I guess Tammy will receive her award uh, later. Let's give it a big hand for Tammy. And then we had uh, some wonderful uh, entries for the praise uh, painting, and Lisa Ellison is the winner of that competition. Yeah. You want to come up, Lowell, and receive uh, Lisa's prize? How about a big hand for all the people that participated in that competition? All right, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Okay, next please. We had a wonderful meeting this week with all the European sanctuaries and brothers and sisters. I think over 70 participants, right? 70 participants. Myself and Cook Jinim at the factory, and we had the international meeting, with a European meeting with them. Um, it was like the first time we were able to interface with the European sanctuaries and the European members all, all over Europe, from Russia to, you know, Spain and, you know, every, everywhere. It was amazing. 70 plus people on this conference call. It was a tremendous, wasn't it interesting? Were you, were you there, Richard? Oh, you weren't on it. Okay. But it was really tremendous. Okay, next, please. <clears throat> Sanctuary Summer Family Camp, that will be June 26th through Ju July 3rd, Camp Daddy Allen. Second, 2 p.m. today will be a meeting for all that are interested. Uh, the location is a small sanctuary. The contact person here is Greg. So if you want more information about the camp coming up, uh, please talk to Greg. We want to thank everybody for their support. All places have been filled already. It's already full. Okay, but, you know, it's going to be a great time. All sorts of different activities, apologetics, uh, you know, and, and Bible-based, biblical training to arm young people to be able to not only converse but debate uh, with high-level, high-level philosophies, different level philosophies in the secular world that they're bombarded with. Okay, so how do you, how do you debate these things? How do you, when somebody asks you, oh, 
you know, do you believe in God? Or, oh, no, God doesn't exist because of this or that reason. How do you debate atheists? How do you debate, debate you know, uh, um, evolution? How do you debate all those things, right? So how do you, having a prepared response uh, is critical, critical, okay? So that's the training of apologetics. Here we'll also be focusing on apologetics as well for the young people. Okay, next please. Freedom Society Seminars, The Power of Evil and the JFK Assassination is what we discussed last week. Uh, join us for our next meeting Thursday, June 9th at, at the uh, CARMS Conference Room, Lords Valley PA, 7 p.m., going deeper, deeper, and delving into, you know, the current system that we're living under today. Where did that start from? Where did that start from? How did this happen, right? Uh, and to look at the historical context. Next, please. Divine Principle Seminars, every third Saturday of every month, and the next seminar will be June 18th, 2016. Uh, we will have the Deep Divine Principle um, Lectures and Seminars, and we will have excellent lecturers like Dr. Brunhofer, James Ward, Dr. Panzer, Tim Elder, Kerry Williams. Williams, you know, so very high-level high level, um, uh, lecturers. And what a great, great way to, you know, restudy the principle. Or, you know, you can, if, you wanna, if you're in, interested in introducing somebody to the principle, it's a perfect place to do so. So that resource will be available for everyone third Saturday, every third Saturday of every month. Okay, next please. Donations requested for tarps. If you have old tarps that are laying around and doing nothing at your home, give them to Sanctuary because we're going to be, with the bushcrafters and the young people, we're going to be making a cool little bushcraft cafe. Okay, so today we're going to be working on, like, constructing the framework of a cool teepee, a kingdom teepee. How's that? <laughs> kingdom teepee. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be working up to make, like, a cool little kitchen table with a little uh, stone and mud oven, which we can hopefully bake pizza in. Bushcraft, primitive pizza. Okay. Very cool. Uh, so if you have old tarps that you're not using... Uh, that are earth tone, if they're brown or they're gray or some kind of earth tone, we'd love to have them so that we could, you know, re, uh, you know, use it in the bushcraft cafe out there that will be slowly developing, okay? Oh, and also, if you have painter's drop cloths, if you've got old painter's drop cloths, that too, we will be able to uh, use as well. So you've got those old painter's drop cloths with the, with the white, you guys feel free to, uh, feel free to have something like that, Okay. We can bring those in too. We can we definitely use those too for the for the TPs and stuff like that. Okay, next please. Growing a faith that last HSU announcement, the final week to sign up for a class. Classes begin the week of June 12. So, you know, if you're interested in taking one of the class, exciting classes that are up, you know, this semester it ends, the registration is ending on June. I'm sorry, they begin the week of June 12th. So get ready to, you know, for an excellent semester with a lot of different offerings from different classes around the country and uh, preparedness, peace, things about the kingdom constitution, things about uh, uh, running, running for Christ, all those things. Uh, definitely, this is the, this is the, these are the classes that you want to, you know, take a look at and check out. It will be the final week this week. So, you know, please either speak to one of the coordinators, or you can do it online, right? You can do it online now. Okay. Next, please. Everyone's welcome for lunch. We thank you all for the wonderful potluck dishes, for respecting adults at lunch on Sunday, the kids, letting the adults go first. Please do not take food into the small chapel or library. The food ministry team appreciates your help in bringing healthy desserts for everyone and creating an enjoyable lunchtime for everyone. Let's give it a one time for the food ministry team, everybody, who was... Who was uh, Every week, they're in there while we're here. Okay? So we thank them very much. Next, please. And Sunday school. Uh, this is a reminder to parents of infants 48 months and below. Please use the nursery room or remain in the main service with your child. And I guess right now, the kids can go off to Sunday school. Is that correct? Okay, teachers and kids, we'll see you guys. Go enjoy Sunday school. Okay. All right, yeah, you guys can go to Sunday school. Enjoy Sunday school, okay? All righty, it's already June 6th. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? 
June 5th, I'm sorry, June 5th. <laughs> June 5th. Okay. Now let's go to, do we have the pointer? Okay. We have the pointer? Okay. The kingdom of life. All right. The kingdom of life. Now this is not a cliche thing where we're going to talk about, you know, how to have just the kingdom, uh, you know, psychology in life, right? This is not a new age self-help thing. But we want to look at the kingdom in terms of now Mark, okay? We want to look at it. We want to look in terms of Mark, okay? So let's, let's skip over to the next slide. Yeah, it's not working here. Okay. And now we've been, we've been going through Matthew, and as you recall, we've been studying about the kingdom of heaven. Okay, and now when we talk about Mark and Luke, the Bible now refers to it as the kingdom of God. Same thing, same place, the kingdom of heaven, same kingdom on earth, and the kingdom of God uh, is the same place. But now we're going to be delving it through Mark and through Luke. Okay, so we're now going to be going through that whole adventure through the gospel of Mark and uh, and Luke as well. Is the pointer working or no? Okay. So just to reframe and recapitulate, everybody recalls why we are talking about the kingdom. Why are we talking about the kingdom so much? Well, a lot of Christians are not reading their Bible. They're listening to what their denomination is saying. If you're from the Catholic Church, you're listening to what the Catholic Church is saying. You're listening to the Episcopal Church, the Baptist Church. We're listening to what the churches are saying or the denominations are saying. But the real task of the Christian is to actually interact and interface with the Word of God. So it's actually to read and interact with the Bible. Okay. So when we look at the Bible, hold on, don't jump forward, guys. Don't, don't jump forward. Can you go back? Oh, is that back? Okay. So when we go to the Bible... Jesus tells us very clearly, every day you must pray. Every day, Christ followers, a Christian is one in Christ, right? So that means somebody who's, who is in Christ. Pray this every day. And of course, we know it. Let's look at the first line here. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We're supposed to pray about the kingdom every day. Amen. We're supposed to be praying about the kingdom every day. We're supposed to be praying that his kingdom comes to this earth every day okay so even when christ instructed his disciples on how to pray he instructed them to pray about the kingdom okay next please okay we're gonna have a little bit of a delay here but in matthew 6 again he says to his disciples but seek ye first thank you seek ye first what seek ye first what what do you say seek ye first the kingdom right 2,000 years of Christ, uh, Christian history has talked about the gospel and salvation as the cross. That is standard, standard Christian, Christian gospel teaching, right? The gospel is the cross. But when you actually read the Bible, it becomes very clear what exactly Jesus is talking about when he's talking about, about the gospel. He says here in this passage, seek ye first the kingdom. First seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. In Matthew 7, he talks about those who say, call him Lord, Lord and profess faith in him. That those kind of people will not enter the kingdom. Not, not only people who just call Lord, Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And when we look at the scriptures, we see the will of the Father is to what? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Matthew 10, in verse 7, he says, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born a woman and hath not risen, a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. We've talked about most of all these scriptures. He talks about in 43, and he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. I am, Jesus is saying, I'm sent for the reason of preaching the kingdom of God. Do you, do you see that? 
I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. He didn't say, I am sent to die on the cross. He said, I am sent to preach. I must preach the kingdom. Okay, so this is, we've, we've been, 2,000 years of Christian history, we have been, every generation, we've thought that the gospel or Jesus' reason for coming was to die. But you can see it right out of his own, out of Luke, in the recorded words of Christ himself. He says, I am sent for the reason of preaching the kingdom. It's very clear. He's also telling his disciples to pray about the kingdom every day. Every day, pray about it. That it comes. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the cross. Gospel of the cross. What does it say? The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel is the word euangelion, which is the good news of the kingdom, which is the word basilia. It comes from basilius, which is the word king. It is the word kingdom, okay? He went about Galilee teaching in their synagogue and preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. And this, most, most Christians who are, you know, uh, who love Christ, who love Jesus, who want to serve him and follow him, yet they don't interact with the Bible, and so they're not reading the Word of God, instead maybe just listening. And of course, faith comes through listening as well. We know our faith increases as we listen to the Word. At the same time, we're called to read the Word, to have a relationship with the Word. And the Word is very clear, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. There it again is Mark, Mark 1.14. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Again, how does Jesus define the gospel? How does Jesus define the gospel? Well, he defines it as the kingdom of God. That's the reason why he sent. That's what he said. So, uh, again, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. What does he say? Repent ye and believe the gospel. Which gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. kingdom. This kind of is shocking. If you heard this, if you grew up in a, in a Christian faith and you heard this for the first time, you're probably going to be shocked because it's not what our denominations tell us. We're usually just taught, you know, and, and of course here in, in sanctuary, nobody's denying the power of salvation through the cross and the grace of God through the cross. However, when Jesus is talking about the gospel, euangelion, he's talking about the gospel of the kingdom. He himself is saying the gospel of the kingdom. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. It's right there in the scripture in front of everybody's nose. Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. There's a similar verse in, in Mark that we saw in the beginning. And healing every sickness, etc. The gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. See, we, we, we associate the gospel with cross. But the Bible does not, especially Jesus. He associates gospel with kingdom. You see? That's a big problem. That's a problem. That's a big problem. If Jesus is associating gospel, the good news, to the kingdom then those who are in Christ have to be associating gospel with kingdom. Amen. And it's right there, verse after verse after verse after verse, in the verses that Jesus himself is speaking. Matthew 24, and this gospel of the crucifixion, and this gospel of the resurrection, Ah, I see how challenging this is. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. This is what he says. Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The end comes when the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom of God, is once again preached. Once again preached. Think about it. How many pure-hearted, good Christians 
are praying for the kingdom to come. We say the Lord's Prayer, and we say it even when we do training, martial arts training, right? The young people, we, we do it after each training we do. We say the Lord's Prayer again after we do all that fight training. And then, and then, but what, think about it. Normally, when you're thinking about all those things, you don't even, we don't even focus on, oh, I'm, I'm praying that the kingdom has to come every day. The kingdom, I'm praying for the kingdom to come every day. We're not even thinking about it. We're, we're already lost already. Right after that verse, then we're, give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and then, you know, we forgot it. But we're supposed to be actually anticipating the kingdom to come. The kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom. Now think about it. If you grew up in a Christian home, Catholic, Roman Catholic, uh, Episcopalian, Baptist, Southern Baptist, Methodist, whatever it is, You've been told the gospel is the birth, the death, the crucifixion, the death, the burial, resurrection. Okay? Through that process, yes, through Christ's death and resurrection, there is salvation. Yes, we understand that. But how did Jesus look at the gospel? What was the gospel he was saying was the gospel? What was it? He said it. Time after time after time again, this gospel of the kingdom, Basilius, Basilius, Basilia, 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 Basilia. And you've seen through Matthew, we worked our way through Matthew. Remember, see how many times he talks about the kingdom of God? Remember all those parables we did in the last couple of months or so? Just parable after parable after parable. It's like, a huge majority of Christ's teaching is about kingdom. Yet we are not hearing his gospel, which is the reason why so many times the church is dying. Amen? So getting back to the gospel, the gospel that Jesus was teaching and for which he was sent, the gospel of the kingdom, when it's preached, then shall the end come. So now we move to Mark. We move to Mark 4. And here we see a repeat of what we saw in Matthew 1 in, in two of the sections. Okay? So we, let's read this together. We're actually going to do a little Bible reading. Let's read it together. Because we're almost like as we work through these parables, we're actually kind of reading the Bible together. Isn't that exciting? We're like on an adventure where we're reading and working our way through the Bible. At least the, at least the Gospels. Okay? So we'll read this together and then we'll focus in on, you know, two of the parables. But there's actually four here. So let's read this uh, chapter together, or a big part of the chapter. Let's go to Mark 4 and 1. Let's read together. And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold. There went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Another fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, some 100. And he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Continue on. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked of him the parable, of the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without... Or outside, all these things are done in parables. That seeing that may see, they, they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And, know, and how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. 
And these are likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorny thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceit of riches and the lusts of other things entering it, choking the word and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, sixty, and some a hundred. Okay, so that's the first parable. Then he goes on to say, And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be set on a candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you. And until you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given. And he that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. 26. And he said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow, grow up. He knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with much, many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Amen. Okay, so we saw the similar uh, scriptures, okay, in, in uh, Matthew, okay, especially the one where Jesus is explaining the word that is given, the seed that is sown, and some falls on stony ground, some falls on, you know, has shallow earth, some has thorns, some on good soil, right? We've seen this one before. And we talked about this in the context of the kingdom. Remember, he says the kingdom of God is like this. He's using examples to explain a kingdom, right? So he's using examples to explain a kingdom, not an individual thing. So usually in, in Christian theology and uh, in pastorship, most people will interpret these things as personal lessons, so Jesus talked about the mustard seed. Okay, you know, uh, so we have to uh, let you know, you have to believe in yourself or have faith in the mustard seed. As you know, small as mustard seed can move mountains, and they connect it to that scripture. But Jesus is saying, He says very clearly in all these parables, these parables is when He is describing the kingdom of God. So he's not talking about, you know, just individualized things. He's talking about a actual kingdom. He's talking about a kingdom. But at the time of this teaching, as you all know, Jesus lived in a satanic kingdom. He lived in the Roman kingdom, which was a satanist, satanic, pagan kingdom. Okay? So everybody in that community, in the society, only knew that type of satanic kingdom. Right? Where the king rules as a tyrant over all, and he basically owns all the land and all the vassals and all the, you know, commission, uh, you know, the statesmen, the Roman statesmen, basically own little parts. They're like little mini fiefdoms, right, for Rome. And they're all centralized back to Rome. Rome is the center of the world, right? So this is the kingdom they live in. This is the reality they live in. This is the empire under which they live. It is a satanic kingdom. It is an anti-God kingdom. And so, even if Jesus explains the kingdom, people cannot understand it. 
The reality is so anathema to what he's explaining. It's like trying to explain freedom to a communist, a person who lived in a communist system, been brainwashed by propaganda all their life about communism, how centralized government serves them, and it's their daddy, and it's perfect for them, and they need it, and all that. Anybody who's grown up in a communist state, you know it's so hard to teach them about, talk to them about freedom. They think freedom is being under the rule of a centralized power. Does it make sense? So Jesus spoke in parables. He spoke in parables, not that these are actual characters in the parable, or when he's talking about sower, there's an actual farmer that's sowing seeds, and this, he's the actual, right? He's talking about this, the kingdom is like this. Does that make sense? It's like this. But his point is he's talking about a kingdom, okay? So, of course, we talked about this in the context of Matthew. Uh, when, when Jesus mentioned these things, he also described this particular parable explaining the stony ground and the shallow earth and explaining the uh, uh, thorns, etc. And remember at the, at the end where, where, where there's good fruit, where it's planted in good fruit, there are some that bring forth fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Why is this why is it different? Why don't they all just bring forth the same fruit? Right? Remember this? We talked about this maybe a month ago. 30, 60, 100-fold. Why? In the kingdom, which is centered and is rooted in God's love, the gift of which is freedom and responsibility, the gift of which is that the normal citizen are co-heirs with Christ, which means what? Even the normal citizen is a king. The normal citizen, it's an upside-down kingdom, something we can't imagine. Because we, we have become slaves under the political ruling classes in most of Western culture, civilization now in the, in the West. You know, and most across the world we see it's a ruling class and then it's a populist class. Right? So we, have, we're not, we can't even imagine that there will be a kingdom where the people will be co-heirs with Christ. They will literally rule with Christ. They will be kings in that nation. It's a nation of kings, and there is a king of kings kingship there. Amen? You see? It's an upside-down kingdom. It's a kingdom that is anathema to the satanic world because Satan's world continually makes the same boring stuff. Tyranny, oligarchy, socialism, communism, same stupid stuff. That's all they make. Every single generation, that's all he makes. Boring pitiful, totally, you know, destroying human destiny and human, human life, humanity. We see this every generation. It's never been different. It's always been the same. Always the same cycles of tyranny. Always the same cycles of same propaganda with socialism, communism, oligarchy. Same system. Leads to the same place. A couple families ruling over everything. Right? And we know those societies always collapse. So we know that America came to the growth stage level of perfection. It came to the closest of the kingdom. It came closest in giving the world freedom and responsibility. Right? But we know because of the sin of slavery, we know because of the sin of slavery... Then the amendment process was open, and through the amendment process, the American Constitution has been destroyed, ravaged, which is now why we don't live in a free state or a republic, which we were supposed to be. We have now degraded into a democracy, which, of course, historically, learn history, folks, democracies always collapse into oligarchies. The Roman Republic was a republic, represented government. Then it changed to democracy, mob rule, which then changes to oligarchy. That is the pattern of history. Democracies are only transitional political systems. They never last. They always lead to oligarchy. Okay? So we see that here in America, too. We are now officially recognized as an oligarchy now. We're not even a democracy anymore. 
And I've, 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 I think I've showed you some of the articles on, on the BBC has reported about that. Officially, we are now, sociologists see us as an oligarchy, where a few ruling families essentially rule over the, the legislation, the laws of the nation, governed by a few huge mega corporations. We have strayed so far from individual rights and citizens being sovereigns, it's been lost in America. Okay? But in Chaniguk, there is no amendment process. When heaven's law come to earth, humans don't have the power to change it. They don't have it, because when the humans try to change it, they always mess it up, and they get sucked into the trap of what? Socialism, communism, oligarchy, boring tyranny. That's all they do. That's all they do. So the upside-down kingdom of the millennial reign of Christ is upside-down. It's totally opposite. It is anathema to what exists and has existed throughout fallen history. It's opposite. It's where the kings are the citizens. The political leaders are servants. And they are accountable to the kings. Right? The citizens have the rights of kings. Remember, in history, only kings had the right to own territory, have their own kingdoms. Only kings had the right to not be taxed on their territory. Only kings had the right to have arms and weapons to defend their kingdoms, right? But notice in socialism, communism, oligarchy, ty tyranny, any form of tyranny, they don't allow the citizens to have any of those kingly rights. Sorry, when God's kingdom comes, it's upside down. The citizens have the kingly rights. They have the rights of kings to have their kingdom, to not be taxed on that kingdom, to not be forcibly taxed, to not to also to bear arms against those who will try to destroy that kingdom. The citizen is the king. The servant is the politician and the political class that must serve the people. That makes sense? And so, look at this. When in that kind of kingdom of freedom and responsibility, in Chinese with the Chinese Constitution, the, the Environmental Protection Agency is illegal. A welfare state, illegal, not allowed. Right? A, a centralized... Regulated, everything regulated in the centralized government, growing beyond 10% GDP. Illegal. Representatives are elected from 200 to, I'm sorry, 2,000 and 2,100 people. A very small group of people are voting for the representatives, which makes them immune, in terms of the whole nation, of being bought off by huge corporate interests, big monopolies. We've talked about this many times. And in that nation of freedom and responsibility, depending on how you, we serve others or we serve each other, how, who, who loves others the most, who serves others the most, Jesus said, right? He who will be greatest will be a servant in the kingdom. He who serves others the most, if you own a business and you own an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur and you're serving your customers very well, you serving them, you're producing things that are helping their lives, making them more efficient, happier, etc. You will get rewarded in freedom. Where the government is not intruding and interfering in that relationship. So if you serve them well, you make a 30-fold. If you serve them better than that guy who's doing 30-fold, you make a 60-fold. If you serve them even better, you make a 100-fold. Not everybody does the same in the kingdom. Depending on how much and how well we serve others, we get blessed in the kingdom. Does that make sense? It's an upside-down kingdom. It's not on whose, whose political line you ride on or who, pol who politician you know to get some success for your family. No. It's how well you serve others. It's the upside-down kingdom. So we talked about that parable when we covered it in Matthew. Now, Jesus, right after that parable, he talks, he said, and he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, 
and not to be set on a candlestick. Well, what does a candle do? A candle is pulled out. It's not pulled out in the midst of the noontime sun. It's pulled out when? During the night. The candle is pulled out in the darkness to illuminate and to be able to see so you can see your environment, you can see what is going on, right? And a candle is not to be brought out just to be hid or to be snuffed away. The Chanigo Constitution, the, ki- the ch- Constitution of the Kingdom of God is not only released to be hid under a bushel or a bed, it is to be put on a candlestick. It is to be proclaimed. It is to be shown to people. Because why? When people hear it, yes, when they first hear it, they may ch- get challenged with it. But their original mind, they know that is the kingdom in which God will reside. They know in their heart of hearts. So the kingdom and the constitution is not to be hidden. It's not to be put on the bed. It is to be put out as a candlestick. If we are not, if we are ashamed of the constitution, if we are ashamed of the kingdom, then how will, the, how will others learn about the kingdom? Amen? Does that make sense? So Jesus is talking about the whole context of the kingdom, and then he says, would you bring a candle and hide it under the bed? No, we will put it on a candlestick and let it glow, let it light. Right? It will not only help us illuminate our lives, it will help the world illuminate their lives to see the kingdom that is coming. Because, folks, it's now released into the atmosphere. It can't be stopped. No matter how much the globalist or the world government people or all the people who love centralized power and want to create worldwide dictatorship and communism, no matter how much they fight, they always lose. In the end, they always lose. Because when God's kingdom comes, they really lose big time, not just the small losses. They lose the entire war when God's kingdom comes. So Jesus is reminding us here, when there's nothing hid, then which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but it should come abroad. These things cannot just be kept to ourselves and the joy that we feel when we hear about the kingdom. When we hear about that land of freedom and responsibility, when we hear about the land where no physical earthly power is dictating and mandating to me how I have to live my life or forcing my children to be put into public education school centers, which are really indoctrination centers, and be taught what they call health sciences, and they're taught how to have sex in 50 different ways at five years old. Hypersexualization is what you call in psychology, and that's what's happening to the youth through the public school system, right? What did we say when the, gay, the homosexual agenda was being pushed, that political agenda, not about being against uh, this or that thing, it's about a political agenda to centralize power, right? What happens there? Oh, well, then the other forms of sexuality start flowing out. Once we start governmentally supporting and subsidizing other forms of family structure that then God God did not ordain, what happens? Every other form of perversion will arise. We talked about a year or two ago. And we see it now with the transgender movement and, oh, you're transphobic, blah, blah, blah. Yo, you're, you know, if you're against, if you're against somebody, a 40-year-old man who thinks he's a woman, even though he has a sexual organ that is a male, and he has an X and Y chromosome, well, you have to still let him believe he's a woman. Hello? This is not sane behavior. This is called mental illness. You are, that is called mental illness. So it is normalizing mental illness and sickness so that people will give up their rights as long as they can believe they're some kind of superhero and, oh, I'm fighting for this, you know, social justice and all the transgender community, etc. But remember, as long, if you do that, you're good as long as you give up your rights. Make sure you're against free speech and make sure you want to censor people and make sure you want to take away people's guns and make sure you want to build up government, right? Then you're good. Then you're okay. Okay, you're good. That's absurd. This is the standard takedown doctrine of communism, 
Socialism, oligarchy, standard procedure. Standard procedure. Okay, and then we not only see with the, the homosexual gay uh, uh, political agenda, which then moves to transgender political uh, agenda, which now is moving to pedophilia, pedophile, what they call child attraction syndrome. Okay? And now that is being said, oh, well, we're so discriminated against. Don't discriminate against us. We have a disease, right? Remember, the same words, same words. It's genetic, right? Same words as the homosexual political agenda. Remember this? Same exact words. Oh, it's genetic. Understand us. We struggle with this. Don't discriminate against us. Same words. Then it moves to transgender. Then it moves to pedophiles. You know why? Because at the top level, the Satanists are pedophiles. They like raping children and killing them. Historical fact. Look at the Transylvania royalty. They were sacrificing children. The women actually drank children's blood because they thought it made them get younger. That's where you get the whole Dracula legends. So royalty and the elites have been into satanic doctrine, which of course is destroying the youth, destroying the innocent, destroying purity, revi reveling in destroying purity because they know those people are innocent, the children's children are innocent, destroying innocence, ravaging it and reveling in that power. It is a weak, twisted, petty, Venomous, demonic spirit that does that. And if those fools ever get in a room with a real man, they're going to pay. Everything they fear is going to be in their face. And if a real man gets their hands on somebody like that, boy, oh boy, we have a good time. We have a really good time. This is what the weak, pedophile elites, they want. Normalize sexualization, hypersexualization. Normalize deviant forms of sexual behavior because they're doing it. Make it seem cool. Make it seem good. So what the Bible says, good gets seen as evil. Evil gets seen as good. That's when the kingdom of hell is at hand, right? In Chaniyuguk, the natural country, kingdom of freedom and responsibility, because you have to preserve your freedom, and because you yourself are your neighbor's keeper, you yourself are part of the peace police and peace militia, you yourself, there's no centralized police force, there's no centralized army, you yourself are the angel that will protect your neighbor when he's being attacked or his daughter is being assaulted. I will be the one who goes over and gets that assailant because I'm a police officer in the kingdom, right? Everybody has the duty of also being part of the peace police and peace militia. It's part of the responsibility of being a free and sovereign king, right? Being a free and sovereign king. You not only, you don't have things done for you all the time. When war comes, you have to go and fight. That's what a king does. Does that make sense? Then just sit and eat filet mignon all day. And when the war, if some battle happens, he's got to go on the front line and fight. Otherwise, none of the knights, none of the troops are going to fight. Right? Yes. So when Jesus returns, we see in the book of Revelation, when he returns, he's on the front line with the, uh, all the, those dressed in white, clad in white, waging war against Satan's world. Right? So, it's not meant to be under a bed. The kingdom is not meant to be under the bed. Right? Standing up against popular culture, which is trying to enforce and coerce using government power, us to see good as evil, evil as good, to adopt relativism... Standing up against this is supposed to be like the candlestick. 
It's not supposed to be hid under the bed. Talking about the kingdom is not supposed to be hid under the bed. It's supposed to be out in the face of Satan. You pull out the candlestick, you got to see the wolf. That's out there, right? <laughs> when the wolf is running around your camp, you don't put the candlestick under your bed. You pull it out and say, where are you, wolf? I'm going to shoot you now. <laughs> I'm going to get you. <laughs> right? That's what you do. You shine the light on him so he cannot hide. Evil likes the shade, the shadows, right? Hiding in the shadows. Look at family fraud. Look at them. In the shadows. Constantly in the shadows. Not, not even being able to have an answer for anything. Have answers for nothing. Why are you persecuting a small church? Why are you taking legal action against the air? Why are you, why are you redacting all of Father's words when he said not to do it? Why are you changing the blessing vows? Why are you going along with anything just for the money, right? No answer. Zero answer in the shadows. So the kingdom as well must be put in the face of evil. There's a great quote. It said, evil succeeds in this world not because of evil, but because of good people who stand idly by. The problem is not evil. The evil you, there's always going to be a potential of evil because there's free will. When you have free will, you can choose good or evil. So there's always going to be somebody who's choosing evil. But the problem is, is when somebody chooses evil, everybody just sits idly by. We don't hold that person to account. We don't hold that thing to account. And then what happens, it degrades it destroys that person, obviously. And of course, in the end, it destroys that kingdom. The morals decay. That kingdom decays. Any sense of commonality between language and culture decays. And now you are in a clash of civilizations in your face, in your own nation. And that's when your kingdom's coming down. That's what's happening here in America. Matthew, Mark 4. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed onto the, into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring forth and grow up, he knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, etc. Isn't this interesting? It's very interesting. It is like this. It is like a man who sows seed and night and day he doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to do anything. And the fruit will naturally rise. Isn't that, amazing? Isn't that interesting? We talked about this, remember, in a kingdom of freedom and responsibility. Think about it, where you don't have social security. There's no social security system. There's no welfare system. There's no public school system to indoctrinate kids, right? You have a system which encourages three generations to stay together. Now, look at the secular system. We'll get a little more. Let's get deeper. In the secular system, what does the secular system do? Your parents are a problem. If your parents do something, you have to report them to your teacher, honey. Keep watching your parents. If they do something wrong, if they say something that's hate speech against what we're teaching, you have to report them. They tell the kids, report the parents. Even though the parents are just expressing their First Amendment rights and their religious freedom, right? Parents are also taught what? Parents are taught children are a black hole. They're terrible. They're a million dollars per child. They just suck up your money. All your work gets sucked up into them, and they all just hate you in the end, and they run away and live their own lives. You're taught that as a parent, especially women. You're taught don't have kids. They suck. They're terrible. They'll steal all your money, right? They'll use up all your money. You have to pay. Education is so important, and, and college is so expensive. We're taught to, we're taught specifically to destroy the three generations. Then the welfare state, what does it do? How the black community used to have 80% of young black children grew up with dad and mom. They were the most, they were strong Christian-based families. They were one of the most fastest growing entrepreneurial uh, 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 cultures in America in the 1930s. They were growing so fast, they're becoming richer, they're becoming, they were in all the schools, they had the highest rate of college, college graduation. They were starting businesses. They were actually supporting each other's businesses too, so their community was getting richer and more uh, you know, prosperous. And Lyndon B. Johnson, the big oil gangster from Texas. Remember this guy? We're studying about him now. Big gangster. 
big gangster, pocket man for the big oil companies, and what he do? He's on record saying it. He says, we're going to enslave the black community to vote Democrat for the next 200 years. How are we going to do that? We're going to give them a little, but not enough to make a difference. Why? Because they were super successful. They were growing. They were burgeoning. They were going to outbeat. They were going to become the elite class. Gangster Lyndon B. Brought in the welfare state. What do you have to do once you get the welfare state? You want to get your check? You have to divorce your man. Get rid of your man. Show the divorce paper, then you'll get the subsidy. So what does that promote? Do you think divorce rates went up or did they go down? Whoopsie daisy, they went up. They skyrocketed up. Then you have a situation, if you sleep around with different men, you can also get subsidies for children with different men. So do you think that promotes marriage or does that promote free sex culture? Okay, so then what happens? A lot of kids grow up now in the black community, 30%, only 30% grow up with a dad and a mom. Right? And the reality is what? 54% of black children are killed before they're born. Remember Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood? Where they put it? They put it in the black neighborhoods because they were racists. They were racists. Margaret Sanger's a very famous racist. Get rid of those black babies. 54% of black children Killed before they come out. Killed. Cook Jong made a very interesting statement. He said, he said, when you look at the statistics, okay, now he's talking statistically, ladies. Don't get upset at me. Just think about the statistics, okay? <laughs> he said this. He said, women are actually more violent. They're more murderous. Okay, yeah, I know, I know, I know. When you look at the statistics, Male homicide, men killing men, is like 20,000 per year. Okay, so that's a lot. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of men killing each other. 20,000 deaths a year. That's pretty bad, right? When you look at abortion rates, women killing a baby, 2 million per year. 2 million per year. 2 million per year. Young children being killed. Okay? Now, these are statistics that we have to be aware of. Right? If, you, if, we, have the, we, if we do things in the dark, and socially it's okay to kill children because it's in the liberal, you know, progressive, fake communist culture, they say, oh, it's cool, it's empowering. No, you're killing a child that's not empowering. You're killing a child that would have grown up to be the president or would have grown up to be a CEO or would have grown up to make the cure for cancer. You're killing somebody. You understand? Doesn't matter if I'm a man and I kill a grown-up man. That's killing somebody. If, you, if we kill a baby, that's an innocent, 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 innocent being who has no means to defend themselves. It's actually worse. Right? So it's very serious. This is a very serious issue. Very serious issue. But nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about it. Because we can't tell the truth. In our society, we cannot tell the truth. But that's why, ladies, and that's why I always warn my girls, ladies, watch out. The archangel is always after you. Always after you. He needs your support. He needs your support to bring in tyranny. Hitler needed the women's vote to bring in tyranny against the Jews. Stalin needed the women's vote and he can smooth talk you, he can promise you good things, and he can get your vote. Be careful of politicians. They are sneaky, two-tongued snakes. They're supposed to be your servant, not your man. Amen, Amen. right? So ladies in this community, we're, we're, these are empowered women. These women are stronger, okay? But if anybody were seeing this for the first time, this should make you think. This should make you think. Right? How the devil try, how Archangel, his system, his big government tries to go after you. They know you're the key. They got to get your vote. Right? So in the, in the free, kingdom of freedom and responsibility, look at this. The fruit naturally comes. Fruit naturally comes. 
When people are free and responsible, and we don't have social health care, social, uh, social security system, which, by the way, they stole all your money anyways, older folks, you know. You know there's no money in social security now. <laughs> Sorry. There's no social security. There's no welfare state. It supports small entrepreneurial businesses. Businesses that parents have made and they want to pass down to their children. Businesses that encourage, hey, I have this skill set, I have a farm, I grow apples, I'm an apple expert, so I want to teach my kids to be an apple expert so they can take over the family business. And then you see your parents as a resource because they're the one who started the business, knows the ins and other business, you see them as a resource, not an enemy. The parents see the young children, the children that they're raising, not as a liability like the modern, quote, parents. They see them as an asset. These are children that are going to learn this craft. They're going to take it over one day, and they're going to be able to succeed for our family. You see them as an asset, which is the reason why you don't just say, oh, I'm going to have one kid, and that's it. No, you may have lots of kids because having lots of kids means many more people you can train to develop that dynasty. And so it encourages fruit to be produced, good fruit, Three generations to stay together, not to be torn apart. Remember one, one brother from Brooklyn here, the Italian brother from Brooklyn, he said when he was younger, man, when they had a Christmas party, they had cousins and this cousin and that cousin, and the nephews and nieces came. There's like a thousand people in one house. And they said, that was amazing. Now you get a Christmas in an Italian family in Brooklyn, and there's nobody there. Right? They have divided up. The three generations that used to stick together, which is a powerhouse. When the three generations stick together, folks, that's a power structure. That's something that monopolies hate because they learn all the trade secrets already from their dad and moms. They're going to be very competitive in that marketplace. They're going to serve customers well. They're going to have morals because they grow up with their parents and grandparents. They're going to work hard and have a work ethic because they've been, from a young age, they're used to it. They're tough. Right? If you can break that up, you can take over that civilization easy. But in the kingdom, naturally, three generations stay together. Naturally, they're staying together. It's an incentive to stay together because 30% plus of the kingdom is entrepreneurs. It's maximizing entrepreneurs, maximizing ownership, maximizing sovereigns, maximizing people's potential to be owners. When you are an owner, you don't want to just give it to somebody. You want to give it to your children. But you don't want your ch to give it to your children so they screw it all up. You want to give it to them so they can make more fruition and, f and fruitfulness. Amen? So you want to properly train them. And you want them to properly grow and have the right instruction, instruction and be humble, yet be confident, etc. It supports a three-generation kingship. Whereas our current system around the world destroys generations and families living together. It says if you're living with parents, you're a loser and you're a, you're a, you're a you know, slob, blob, you know, fat, you know, messed up thing. You're a you're loser. Right? That's our popular culture. Not you are learning a craft. Not you are learning to, uh, you know, take over the reins one day. Not you are learning how to be humble and learn this skill from your parents. Not that. You're a loser. You're a sin, right? Generations should not stay together. Who supports this? Who supports this? Does, our, does God's, God support this? Did Father, was Father supporting this? No. no. Father was always against this. He said three generations must live together. And think about it. In terms of a free and responsible kingdom, where that child, that grandchild is now old enough to start taking the reins, he will want to hear the words of wisdom from granddaddy. He will want to, grandpa's not an old fogey that you know, just farts all day. This guy's full of knowledge. This guy is full of knowledge. If I'm, if I'm in some business which I need to ask questions to, he's an incredible mentor, right? But we are taught and trained to destroy the generations to be together. Whereas in the kingdom, naturally, without putting an effort, because all the incentives to destroy generations are out, naturally. Naturally, the seed springs up and brings forth fruit. 
See, when Father was talking about the, the four great realms of heart and the three kingships, remember that? He was predicting the future of Chanegu. That is how it will become because all the incentives in that nation are incentivizing families staying together, passing on their craft to each other. Ownership, sovereignty, you see? Families that are working with each other, intergenerational transmission of dynasty and success, victory. Whew. Folks, that's the kingdom. And then Jesus, of course, likens it. We saw this also in Matthew, where he likens it to a mustard seed, which is smallest, but then grows to be the greatest. Remember this? They may be laughing at us now. The UN and the world government people and the Center on Foreign Rel Relations will be laughing at us now. But when their system of tyranny collapses, which it must, and they see the small mustard seed of the kingdom, and the Lord that has established his kingship come into the harvest. Shoots past all those earths, becomes greater than all those, shoots out grace branches and creates all the rest area for all the fowls of the air to reside in. Remember the kingdom. Remember we talked about the kingdom as well. It doesn't only have perfect people in there. It has free people in there, Right? Free people, free and responsible people. It also has vultures that are there too. There's predators there too. But the young men and women and all the people, just like we're doing here, it's interesting, all the young people, man, these guys are getting tougher and tougher. How, how many, we did, we did punching in the face the other day, right? How many of the young people got punched in the face first time? Hey, there you go. <laughs> they got punched in the face first time. What a beautiful experience. <laughs> it's such an important experience, okay? It's such an important experience. I'm telling you it is. People are over scared of getting punched in the face. It's such an important part of your life. What's it, you get punched in the face first time. Get choked out for the first time. It's a huge eye opener. You become totally different. You, your, your thinking becomes realistic. You know? We may be small, but the peace police, peace militia, the kingdom of those who are sovereigns and kings who know I have a right to self-defense. I have a right to my person. I have a right to preserve my temple of God. No one can cross that boundary. Right? People who know that dimension of the kingdom, boy, all the communists hate that. Hate it. Whenever we speak like this, they hate it because they want you to feel like you are property to them. No. We are children of God. The body of Christ and the bride of the bridegroom. The most precious species on the universe. No totalitarians can stand over us. None. And when the kingdom, when the people of the kingdom begin to realize this, even through the tribulation, like the mustard seed, the kingdom will begin to sprout. It will begin to sprout. And his kingdom, when it comes, it won't go away. It won't go away. Satan is going to be under the foot of the righteous kings who love God and who know his grace. Done. That kingdom is called the millennial reign. And that is a kingdom. That is the gospel. And that we desire to see. All right, SOS, come on up, guys. When we're praising God today, we encourage you guys, everybody, reflect on the kingdom that is coming. Be sovereigns, folks. Be sovereigns. We are to be kings in the kingdom, not slaves, servants, or lackeys to Satan. Let's praise God as we do with that mindset, with that mindset. Amen. God, everyone. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul. 
the Lord. Here are 10,000 of them. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy
my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore well, Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before I'll worship your holy name. Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Please join me in Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen and adieu. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Because you are good, you're good, oh. You are good, you're good, oh. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song, cause you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh,
You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna.
예수님 승리 엄만세 만화왕 전쟁 잠을 3대 왕권 엄만세 천일국 다 킹덤 컴 엄만세 아주 아주 Hug your neighbor. Welcome, welcome. Hug your neighbor, folks. Amen.